Hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa special here in Zambia, Lusaka. We'll be taking a look at leading women. Now this is an imperative time for Zambia as a country as it will be celebrating 50 years of that rather celebration of that country's uh, economy as well as growth and independence uh, later on in October this year. But to help us unpack as to how the female voice is being received in Zambia. I've got my distinguished guests with me. Thank you so much for joining us. And just to introduce you to my right, we've got the uh, Bank of Zambia's Deputy Governor, Dr. Tukia Kankasa Mabula. To uh, the middle there, we've got the Chief Programs Officer of Zambia National Commission for UNESCO, Brenda Montemba, and the Chief Executive of Java Foods, Monica Musonda. Thank you so much for joining us today, ladies. Uh, as you can tell, we've got a lovely turnout here. So ladies and a couple of gentlemen for protection. Um, <laughs> But perhaps if we can take a look at the voice of the Zambian female over the last 50 years. Is it being heard, Deputy Governor? Yes, I would say that the voice of the Zambian female has been heard. We have had quite a vibrant women's movement. But if we begin from the beginning, we actually had women participating directly in our struggle for independence. And we've had uh, also women who are supporting their spouses in the struggle for independence. So we were there from the beginning. And uh, in the First Republic, um, immediately after independence, we had a, a number of women uh, participating at the highest levels as cabinet ministers, as according to the political dispensation then, as members of the Central Committee. So we've had women participating in decision making. I think the problem has been the numbers. Uh, from the NGO uh, sector, We've had um, women advocating for various changes, and I think as a country, we have seen quite a lot of uh, changes. For example, we're one of the countries that actually has paid maternity leave of uh, three months for uh, most senior people and four months for the lower paid uh, employees. And a lot of people don't realize that this is actually not a universal right mm. for women, but uh, I think this came out of um, advocacy of uh, Zambian women. Obviously, we can do more because if we had arrived, we should be 50 50. We're not. When we look at numbers in all spheres of um, uh, the Zambian society, you find that uh, women are really not participating in the numbers and at the levels that we would like to see. So there's more work to be done. Brenda, I take it you perhaps share the same sentiments as the Deputy Governor? Yes, I do agree um, with uh, Dr. Kankasa. And um, I believe that what we're seeing now is a state where women are beginning to talk with their mind, as opposed to um, the Cha 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 movement where women would have to take off mm -hmm. their clothes to say, we're not getting dressed until you give us what we want. So at this point, you've got a woman that can talk with a pen and um, she can talk with her intellect and she's able to say, this is what I am. It doesn't matter what you think of me, but I know who I am and I can stand for what I believe in. Uh, we've got role models um, that are still alive in women. Mama Kankasa, that is, you see the proceeds here with uh, Dr. Mabula. And um, we also have the late uh, Princess Nakatindi winner. These are women um, that stood by their husbands, but even alongside the husband in their own right, they were able to fight for the struggle of independence. And even now we go back to them and we ask them for counsel. They're not going to tell you that the woman's place is in the kitchen mm. because they know um, that if they had stayed in the kitchen, we wouldn't be where we are today. They, they tell stories of how they packed stones in bags and gave to the men to go and throw stones at the colonialists. But now we don't use stones. We, we use the stone of the pen. And I agree completely. I want us to explore that fact a little bit further. And maybe, Monica, you can also come in here. Uh, especially as African women, you're taught by your mother, your grandmother, that you need to be humble. You need to be respectful. Uh, is there a place for this kind of woman, perhaps in corporate Africa? Oh, most definitely. I think the issue now, and in Zambia in particular, is no longer are women capable. That has been proven, and it's been proven time and time again. And I think the point is how many women are now moving forward in, in the corporate world, in, uh, um, in business, in leading roles for decision making. And that is the issue that we're facing now in Zambia, that we are seeing more and more women coming through, young girls going through school, but now what happens when they enter into the workforce or they enter into business? What, what happens after that? Are we encouraging our, our, our young girls and women to take the step further, to, to actually step up 
and be decision makers. And I think it's not only a Zambian issue, I think it's something all across the continent where you'll see that as you go up the ladder, there are fewer and fewer women. But it's all a process and I think it's how we, um, it's, it's happening, it is definitely happening. The pace has to be quicker, I can mm -hmm. definitely say that. Um, but there's a lot of positive energy and you can see even in this room, a number of the women who have attended today are leading decision makers, are uh, heads of business and heads of corporations. So things are definitely moving forward in Zambia. So quite clearly, something like mentorship is something that's crucial mm -hmm. to this kind of development. But is mentorship, like Monica said, perhaps it's moving along, progressing too slowly. Is it taking place efficiently? I put this into perspective because so often, black women are, are seen as once they're in a powerful position, they become hungry to contain that power and to keep it to themselves and not share. And some people often uh, compare them to having characteristics which rhyme with the word itchiness. I won't relay the word, but uh, is that the situation at the moment, Brenda, when, when you take a look at the situation? Um, that's probably not the situation that I see. Um, we have a lot of mentorship programs. Zambia has a system where you pick an ambassador for something. So it's a, there's a goodwill ambassador for this, goodwill ambassador for the other thing. And I see a number of uh, young ladies that have been picked as goodwill ambassadors. and. Um, Part of being, will, being a goodwill ambassador is to pick a number of boys and girls that you take along through a process. Uh, not only do we have FAWESA, which is the Forum for um, Women Educationalists in Zambia, we have other women's lobby groups and the men's groups as well that take mentorship uh, on a serious level. We have uh, mentorship programs where um, you take young girls and young boys into your home. We used to have that. Uh, we haven't done it in the last year or two, but would have that after a Congress, like um, you have 300 girls, then each one of you picks maybe five girls and goes home with them for a week and two weeks. And after that, they become your children, so to say. Uh, we, we have um, social media such as Facebook, where you actually have a following and those are your mentees. So you, you're mentoring those. Um, young girls and young boys. I believe that mentorship should actually even be more for the boys because we want the boys to make a good man. And so the girl will be a good girl if she's mentored and she has a good man alongside her. Um, I believe mentorship is going on because now we actually have young girls in Zambia that can pick a woman to say, that is my role model. Yeah. We never had that some time back. You, you would pick, um, a role model somewhere in America or somewhere, somebody you'd never see. But now we do have young girls that can pick a Zambian woman as their role model. That is good. Indeed. Yeah. Good. Just to add to that, I think what we're seeing, and it's an important point aside from mentorship, is that the more and more women you're seeing in, in very important decisions, like the deputy governor of administration here, the more people, the more young women and young men are, are seeing and getting used to the fact that women are now can hold the mantle. And you, you, you encourage people, because then I know I can also do it. What path did, did we take? Did, did Dr. Mabula take? What did she do to get there? And her story is no different from a lot of people's stories. And the more and more we see that happening in our country, the more and more women will be able to step up. And no, it is not an impossible job. Mm -hmm. It is, mentorship is definitely important, but we need to see, we need, people need to see more women doing more things. We need to profile not only just us three women, but a lot of other people who are doing very interesting and very amazing things in this country. And the more young people see that, the more people are going to say, I too can do it. It's so important that you touched on young people then. Dr. Kankasa Mabula, perhaps if we can come to you, you often speak to young men and women and motivate them and encourage them to enter the business sphere and, and follow their dreams. Are they receiving this message well? We yes, I, I believe that um, they are receiving this message well. And I do get some feedback. Often when I've spoken to, to a group of people, I do get pe uh, people getting back to me and saying, oh, I, I inspired them on this and they took away this. Um, so I think uh, that deliberate inter uh, intervention is actually having results. But I want to go a little bit back to your previous question about what our grandmothers taught us mm. and the traditional counselors. Again, through advocacy, this is one area that is being changed around to be a positive. And I think the, the best example I can give you is about uh, the AIDS messages. Previously, um, Zambian women were taught to be submissive and to you know, never say no if your husband uh, desires anything from you. 
But those same traditional counselors have been brought on board to, uh, on board to give the positive messages, the risks of uh, AIDS, the need for a woman to negotiate in the homes. So um, existing traditional institutions are actually being used to respond to today's needs. Mm. And this has been as mainly as a result of um, the advocacy of women's groups. Coming back to tradition, Brenda, you also mentioned something quite imperative that it's all good and well to change the mindset of the girl child. But what about our sons? Mm -hmm. What are we teaching our brothers about women and how they should also be empowered? Uh, are, are we there yet or are we still lacking in that department, Brenda? I think we're still lacking. Um, the education system for a long time disadvantaged the girl because the girl had to stay home to be with the mom and, and take care of the home. Um, she wasn't asked how many children the mother should have, but if the mother had 10, then one of the girls had to be the co-mother. But uh, with a new educational policy now, things are changing. Um, the girl child has the right to go to school as much as the boy does. But we're running the risk of now concentrating too much on the girl at the expense of the boy. And that has been noticed. So now the boy child has been brought on board. You, you have to train the boy to be a complete man. You've got to train him to, to wash the dishes, to, to make tea, to cook for himself and um, cook for the family. And this is why you find that the elevated woman, quote mm. unquote, uh, finds it difficult to make it in the corporate world. Because if she has a man that grew up thinking the, man, the woman's place is in the kitchen, then if she gets home at 20 hours, he's waiting. She has to cook, she has to clean the dishes, and she, she's got to cook in the bedroom as well. So that, <laughs> you know, that, that, that is changing now. Because um, maybe I'll take you back a little bit to Zambian tradition. Zambian tradition, before the girl gets married, she, she has to be taken in to be taught. And we've realized that the boys were not being taught. In the villages, they used to be taught. But in town, the boys go into marriage without being taught. But now that is changing. Counseling has to encompass the two. Mm. Um, so if the woman must make it, if our young entrepreneur here must make it and run Java company, she's got to have a good man who is a partner in all ways. And I, I hope we'll get there quick. We're getting there, but a little bit of a slow pace, but we're getting there. Well, uh, the CEO of Java Foods is smiling, so perhaps she does have that man. <laughs> hey? <laughs> perhaps he is there. But as an entrepreneur, your experience, if you could walk us through that, Monica, uh, the, the reception and perception perhaps that men have of women who, who not only are educated, but who work their way up the corporate ladder. Has, has it been difficult to break down those barriers? Um, I think I can speak for a personal, my personal experience here. Um, I've been a lawyer for 15 years and uh, worked a majority of that time outside of Zambia. I worked for big corporates and I worked for uh, DFIs as well. And what it showed during my climb was that hard work is rewarded. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think people, my, the partners I worked for, the, the CEOs I worked for, definitely did not necessarily say, because you know, I was a woman and I was a black Zambian woman, you know, that I was uh, in any way uh, made to sit in a corner, but hard work was rewarded. But also, I myself, Force my, you know, I, I had the mindset to say, well, I'm here for a period and I know what I need to focus on. My, I was there to, to learn as much as I could. I was there to achieve what I wanted and know exactly what, where I was going. So as much as you, you should, I, I mean, my advice to most young women is that when you start working in a corporate, know exactly what you want. Before you start sort of discounting, oh, because this man comes from you know, another part of Zambia and he might not allow me to achieve, you're already putting yourself back, you're holding mm. yourself back. And so as long as you are very clear what you're there for, what you hope to achieve and where you want to go, and this is not just in your professional life, this is also in your personal life, how are you going to balance the two, you will achieve it. And I think um, after 15 years, I think I didn't do too badly. I made the decision to change course completely when I moved back to Zambia and become an entrepreneur. But that was also a personal decision. And I, I bring exactly the same principles of hard work and focus and understanding where I want to go into my business as well. Deputy Governor, I'd like you to bring you in here because it's quite evident that the young women are motivated, they are encouraged. Like Monica, they're breaking barriers. But we've also got a room of women and men here who no doubt are also parents. What should we be teaching our sons? Coming back to that question again about um, yeah. women development and empowerment. I actually like to um, challenge women that we are the mothers. We are the, the ones that raise 
these children that become men, mm -hmm. that then begin to oppress us. How do we create these <laughs> men? <laughs> we have so much power to actually change the future man through the way that we socialize that child as a child. If we want this man to be sensitive, we'll socialize them in a way that will make them sensitive. If we want them not to be selfish, we'll socialize them in such a way. But the way, the traditional way of raising the boy child is to make him feel like he's king, he can just sit down whilst the sister is running around around him and providing, and we have the power to change that. And whereas uh, perhaps this generation has not done so well, we have done better than the previous generation. And the next generation should do even better, but it has to be a conscious, deliberate decision to do something about this. So no doubt the clear challenge to all the mothers out there, hopefully you're listening. <laughs> But also that brings us to the old boys club. Uh, we, we touched on young men here, but also there's a group of older men who have con uh, connections rather that span generations and generations and generations. And Monica, I'd like to bring you in here because um, you've worked with a member of the old boys club, Ali Kodangoti, the richest man on the continent. Uh, but certainly there were lessons that you learned from him that brought you back home. Yes, I, again, it's... Um the All Boys Club is very much in existence, alive and kicking. Um, I often I sit on a number of boards and I think I find sometimes when I open my mouth, people just look at me and then they move on to the next point. But I've also <laughs> known, sure. and it's, it's, it's painful, it's almost like, well, we didn't quite un hear what she said, is it, you know, and she should she be saying it. But I, you find a way, in a very mature and a professional fashion, how to handle it. And this is what has helped throughout my career. Know what you're, you know, prepare yourself for what you're going to do understand the dynamics of the meat, understand the dynamics of who you're working for. So I worked for a very large corporation in Nigeria, which was actually a very Muslim organization. But I did very well because I understood the dynamics of the culture, of how it worked, and they valued professionalism. They valued that the job was done. And that was what I was there for. I wasn't there to socialize or to make friends. As he, they, I was paid a salary to achieve, to make sure things worked, and that's what I did. And so you have to, it will, it's going to take a long time for it to disappear. And mm -hmm. so I always sort of advise young women to say, work, understand what you're there for. And I, I always, sometimes you're not there to make friends. It's a very competitive environment. Think of what young men do. Because when you think of it that way, because some boys are very aggressive at work when they want to, to get something done. Some women always make, sometimes make excuses, well, I can't, maybe they'll, I'll be looked at differently. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You came there because you came to work. You didn't come to make friends. Hmm. So as long as you know, uh, remain professional, understand what you're there for, understand your own goals, and then that's where you break through. And people will see it very quickly. People will say, well, I know she, you know, if you call her, it's a business, it's always going to be business. We're not going to have, you know, laugh about jokes. We're here, we're here to work. And I think that it has definitely helped. You mentioned something so crucial there because it seems as though it's an amalgamation of the female personalities, you know, going back home, you you deeply rooted in who you are, you understand who you are, and um, you, you have these virtues that you stick to, but you also get tough skin. Is this what it is about Brenda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could say so. Um, I've been a police officer 17 years, mm -hmm. and um, this is my 18th year, hopefully my last year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Training, when you're being trained as a police officer, you get trained equally. There isn't um, a simpler training for the women. The women will not go through um, shorter trenches and then the men go through longer trenches. The women will not cross over shorter or lower obstacle crossings. It's the same thing. And when you go into the real world, it suddenly changes. And um, the woman suddenly has to have babies. And the men say, oh, that's why we don't want to employ women. But when it comes to searches, it's only a, a woman that can search a woman at an airport or you have an accused person. Mm. So you cannot say that um, you don't need the women in the police service. You need the women, even in the military, you need them. Our task as uh, women officers, in my particular case, is to remain feminine while doing a man's job. Now that is a job in itself. <laughs> so, Walk us through that, how do you do that? <laughs> You've got to stand your ground. Normally we're given men's boots and I said, look, can you give me women's boots? Because my foot is different, it's fragile, it's delicate. <laughs> so you, you grow thick skin starting from your, the soles of your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and next, when, when they're passing policies, you've got to stand and stand for policies that protect the woman. For instance, um, you've got to remain and say, I will take my mother's day off 
every month. It doesn't matter if I'm on the shift, I'll tell the shift officer that this is my mother's day off. And they will say, oh, we don't care for Mother's Day, but you show them, it's there in the policy. Uh, for instance, another example I could take is um, when you're going out on patrols. When you're going for patrols that give money, they would rather take the men. Mm. No, because they say, oh, the women, they're going to give us problems. Maybe she'll begin her monthlies while we are out on patrol. But I had my monthlies for the one year that I was training. So again, um, the women in the military and in the police, the senior women have got to stand for the junior women. And that has been our job. And I think so far, we've, we, we're, doing, we're doing good. We have a, a woman inspector general of police for the first time in the history of Zambia. And um, I believe South Africa police also has a female commissioner. Yes, yes. Yes. Please. So we're not doing too badly. But under her, how many women has she got? They will always say to you, oh, but you have a woman at the top but she needs women to support her, mm. and we've got to stand for that, mm. yeah. Deputy Governor, perhaps if we can come to you for a little bit of advice here, if you can walk mm. us through how difficult it is as a senior woman in your position, well respected, and you've mm. earned your stripes in order to get there, how difficult is it to uh, embrace those below you and, and push them to also reach your level? Yeah. Yes, I think we haven't said enough about the mindset. We, we do have a problem of uh, the mindset, and my own belief is that you need deliberate interventions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not looked upon very favorably, like affirmative action, mm. but sometimes you do need to have that affirmative action where you're deliberately looking for the women. And they're there and they're good. And it's not about tokenism and you know, elevating um, women that are not worthy to, for the positions. Uh, really, if we're going to, to do a revolution, we do need some deliberate interventions. And what Monica said is also very, very important. Part of breaking down the mindset of the men is to show that you can do it, to show that you're professional, you can work hard, you can be dependable. Or whilst they, wearing stilettos. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to deny our womanhood. I think what we need to appreciate is that we're bringing a lot of value to the table mm. as women, not trying to be men, exactly. but um, as, as women. And what Brenda was saying, uh, especially this Mother's Day uh, thing, I've had heads of department telling me, I don't want any more women, they're going to make me inefficient. I actually encourage my women to only take Mother's Day when they need it, not as a right. Maybe because I'm a lawyer, I know what is the background of uh, Mother's Day. But to some extent, Zambian women have taken it. The law says I can take a day off every month, and they'll take it religiously. Well, it's nice, I suppose. At least you've got that, uh, that right. But I have seen that it actually interferes with uh, women getting ahead, and I've had it thrown in my face. That, look, we need this um, lady to be here, and you know, she's taken the day off. And maybe sometimes I didn't even read it. And um, the, the essence of Mother's Day is that you're not, you're not, you might not be able to give notice that you're going to take um, that day. But we need, to make, uh, we need to work on the mindset of the men. They've been raised in this way to um, not really welcome and appreciate women at the same level as them. There's need to, make, to have an understanding. And Viola is sitting in the audience. I keep saying to her that we need their services to come and sensitize our men. But in the Bank of Zambia, I think because we've been pushing this agenda, we've um, come quite far. We began from a, a, a situation where every time you said something about gender or elevating women, you actually got people laughing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we have our senior management laughing now. Uh, they, they've taken it seriously. They began to understand. And we've been um, uh, propounding this message that it's only when women are fully participating that will see the difference. And it, there's a lot of work, again, to be done in that area. But uh, women being professional, being hardworking, being focused, we're making our own case. And it becomes difficult to deny when you know, they can see that we're able to do it. Mm -hmm. Deputy Governor, how, but how important is policy with regard to that? You mentioned that perhaps it needs to be more deliberate. Yes. Uh, are things changing from a legal perspective? Yes, when you look at Zambia, uh, we've done quite a lot, even the government has done a lot. But one of the shortcomings that I've seen, we, we, we've got, um, for instance, uh, a strategy 
uh, and the plan of action for, for the advancement of women since Beijing, um, which was done by the government. But there's a tendency for people to think this is only for government, it's not for the rest of, um, mm. of um, the country, and some work needs to be done there. And I keep mentioning this, that you know, it's important to, uh, for other sectors to appreciate that the national gender policy is across the board. We, we, um, so we have a framework, and in Zambian law, there was actually an exercise that looked at the laws to amend laws that were discriminatory. We haven't gotten to where we should be because we haven't yet dealt with the Constitution, but um, the particular article that allows for discrimination of women is one of those that has been recommended to be, mm. to be changed. We recognize that policies, laws are important as enablers, but ultimately it's for women to claim their place, mm. to be confident, to put themselves forward, and to be there. Even you know, the areas where um, you may find some constraints, I think being there to fight those constraints is another way to get ahead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, from one lawyer to another, Monica, uh, in the private sector, are you seeing women stamping their approval and uh, moving their way forward? Yes, definitely. And sometimes it's by default. And I say this by default. I mean, Zambia has gone through a lot of economic transformation from um, state-owned into now a lot more, a, a much larger private sector. So you found that when the parastatals began to disappear, mm -hmm. that many of the men perhaps were not working, and the women now stood up and began to take you know, works quite seriously. And we saw a number of women coming into the workforce. And you're also seeing in, in education, a lot of women are graduating, young women are graduating and entering the workforce. As I said, it's no longer an issue of competence. Women are, in Zambia, women are shown themselves time and time again that they are competent. But now it's to push them to the next level. Where they go? Where do they disappear? Where do we lose them? Why are we losing them? Why, are we, why do we only have the IG and then underneath her they're just men? What is going on there? And perhaps one, it's policy, but two, mindset. But also, again, the third one, and I will always say that we, women, we must push forward. Because if we're going to have someone else fight for you, we're not going to do it. If we fundamentally believe we deserve the seat at the table, we have to fight for it. They won't be able to ignore you. And there are many more uh, CEOs in the banking sector, for instance, or the insurance sector. They will have to deal with us and have to respect that of us. And I think you'll see, I, I, I fundamentally hope that we'll see many more women coming and in, in prime decision making points throughout the, the, the sort of the chain. Indeed. Well, definitely with a room, full, a room filled with powerful women as we do have today and men. I must acknowledge that. <laughs> Hopefully that will change in the months to come. Well, uh, we just have to take a quick ad break, but we will be back with the CNBC Africa special leading woman debate here in Zambia. <laughs> A warm welcome back to the CNBC Africa special regarding our leading woman debate here in Zambia in the capital city of Lusaka. I'm still joined by my distinguished guests, the Deputy uh, Governor of the Bank of Zambia, Dr. Tukia Kankasa Mabula. We've got Brenda Muntemba as well. She's the Chief Programs uh, Officer of the Zambia National Commission for UNESCO, as well as the Chief Executive Officer of Java Foods, Monica Musonda. Well, before the ad break, we had uncovered changing the mindset as well as the current environment regarding changing the mindset of both females and males. So you were a powerful woman, you are an entrepreneur, you were a businesswoman, you uh, a social a socialist, and you've made your way into that top position. But many women often talk about the glass ceiling. Deputy Governor, it seems as though you've managed to break several of those, <laughs> given the ranking that you hold at the moment. Uh, for that woman who is probably in this room at the moment and finds themselves stuck in this position that they can't get out of, what do they need to do in order to, to crack that ceiling? I think they need to look at where do they want to go next, as Monica has said, and arm themselves with those requisite uh, uh, skills and um, whatever other requirements are necessary for the next job. And then just put themselves forward, negotiate. I think uh, quite often women feel they cannot ask for that other job if you're coveting a job and it's available, make yourself available and make it known that you want uh, that position. Mm. Uh, I think that can also help. Um, but I also do accept that uh, dealing with men who may have a very entrenched neg negative mindset towards women, deliberate policies, workplace policies, would also be very useful. 
Um, and you can see an example of Lloyds Bank, for instance, that has decided that by 2016, it should have 40% of uh, the top 5,000 positions in the bank held by women. That's another way that you can actually raise and fast track the progress of women. And if people value the um, value that women can bring to the table, we should not shy away from the need to have deliberate policies that are going to put women up there. Uh, quotas. If we look at uh, countries that are doing better than us, you'll find that a lot of them actually had quotas. Some people think quotas are a dirty word that no, you're favoring. But when you look at what women have had to deal with to get even where they are, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a little bit of favoritism to help them get ahead. So I, I think deliberate policies, we need to really advocate on those and see that they're done, that women can be appointed. When we, when we look at uh, Zambia at the moment, you will see even uh, the, um, the head of the police. That's a presidential appointment. The president had a deliberate policy to be inclusive, to bring more women into top leadership positions. And I think he has done very well. Mm. Although, again, there's more that needs to be done. We've been watching the dwindling numbers of uh, women in, in cabinet. At the moment, I think there's only four. Uh, we have um, uh, only about 11% of our national parliament um, uh, uh, who are women. When you look at a country like Rwanda, where there's uh, more or less 50, or maybe even more than 50%, there had to be deliberate policies in place to achieve that. So yes, I think the, the, the most important thing is for women to put themselves forward. And there are a lot of women, good women, that can occupy uh, those uh, positions. And sometimes uh, the, the men with the negative mindset will think, well, that woman has young children, or mm -hmm. some other constraint that they, they'll create for themselves that you know, they can't consider you. But if you put yourself forward and say, I think I can do this job and I see that it's open, that's part of getting, mm. um, getting ahead and breaking the glass ceiling. So you break the glass ceiling, but then there's another impact regarding uh, wage payments. Uh, I understand both in the formal and informal sector, sometimes men get favored and often get paid more. Does that go back perhaps to the traditional society where we view men as providers? He needs to go out and gather and bring home the goods. But you're an equally powerful female. How do I also get the same pay as my male counterpart? Um, as far as government policy is concerned, there isn't a distinction. So um, a male police commissioner will get the same pay as a female uh, police commissioner. But as Dr. Kankas has said, you've got to make yourself available. You know, one thing that I've seen throughout history is that when God wants to make a difference, he'll use a woman. Mm -hmm. If he just wants to do anything, any man is there. But <laughs> look, I mean... <laughs> But just, just take even in the noblest of causes, you know, Mother Teresa, the most noble of causes, but see the impact. And look at um, Lady Diana. You've got Mother Teresa on one end, so noble a task. You've got Lady D on the other side. They die in the same week, and they have the same impact. So you don't have to break a particular glass ceiling as the way we see it. But you've got to know what your calling is and break that ceiling to get to where God wants you to get to. And when you get there, stay there. And when you stay there, bring other women with you. Yeah. Because what happens is that um, you retire or by some force of nature you're, you're taken out. Nobody is there. There's no other woman. So they, they get back to the comfortable thing of just picking a man here and a man there. So for the women that have already broken the glass ceiling, make sure that you've got other young ladies that, that you're, you're taking with you. And you must know that you are there to make an impact. Um, your impact will be extra special. So for an extra special task, you must have extra special muscle. It, it doesn't come easy. Um, men, if you talk of the physique, they, they're already given that physique. They can work longer hours, but a woman has got to work smarter hours. Yeah. So you, you don't have to work the length of time. You've got to work smart. Mm. So I think that um, sometimes we don't stay there as women because we don't realize the special thing that God has put in us. And we've got to realize this, get hold of it, be available, go there, stay there, and take others with you.
such a nice different perspective on things because so often people say we are at, at a genetic disadvantage but it seems as though we've got several advantages mm -hmm. over our male counterparts even though we are not male bashing we are just uplifting our yeah. females <laughs> Mr. Chairman <laughs> but we focus quite significantly on the formal sector and women within the, the corporate society as well as governmental roles in, in Zambia but what about the small time female farmer and uh, perhaps you can bring us uh, into light as to what Java Foods is doing to, to help develop uh, the women that you deal with uh, we, we're all familiar with your brand, yeah, Easy Noodles. You. So you. quite clearly that starts somewhere yeah. before it gets into a package. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was thinking I'm not going to speak about corporate, about breaking glass ceilings, because I think that has well represented here. I wanted to speak about breaking glass ceilings where women are not well represented. So in manufacturing, in other areas of entrepreneurship and trying to encourage more women to actually step out of the role of the corporate world and to, to actually push themselves into other spheres of um, sort of in business, basically. And I think what we're seeing in Zambia is that a lot of women have ended up in corporate and very few are actually stepping out of corporate and perhaps not enjoying their ride in the corporate world. I mean, I always say to people that enjoy what you do because when it gets tough you'll be so miserable in that job even as you keep on going so if you don't like banking and you actually want to be a baker leave and start a bakery mm -hmm. but we're not saying that enough here in Zambia so there are still very few and it's almost as if you are a rare species when they say but you were a lawyer you went to school and now you're doing what mm -hmm. and it's almost as if you know why did they, they, why did why would you do that but the reason why I've done it is because I, did it, I had a great run and I enjoyed law, but I now wanted to do something different and actually wanted to impact lives and young, ch young people in a different way. But what we would like to see is many more, not just women, but even more men mm -hmm. uh, doing just that in stepping out of the corporate world. Or, and also, the corporate world is very limited in jobs. I mean, we see it in Zambia, there are not enough jobs being created for the people who are leaving school. So what is happening? Are people sitting and waiting for someone to give them a job? I hope not. We need to encourage people to now think, say, what can I do? How can I challenge myself and create a business around whatever it is I do? And it's, there's nothing wrong with it. So you're breaking a glass ceiling differently by being the first woman manufacturer of flip-flops, if I can give that example. But we need to see many more of that so you don't become this sort of, you know, why, why is she doing it? It's only reserved for X or Y. But it should be reserved it's for everybody. And entrepreneurial development, you, that just probably sits very close to your heart. Are we seeing enough of that with regard to the female We need to focus? see a lot more. Um, I do a lot of uh, talks to particularly the youth, and I always say that I'm even too old to be an entrepreneur. I should have done this when I was in my 20s. <laughs> because to take risks, you know, we have, when you're, you're older, you have all sorts of obligations and responsibilities, which then sort of divide your time. When you're 20 and you, maybe you're only paying for a one bedroom flat or you're sharing a flat, you can do a lot of things. You can fail, you can try again, you can get a job, leave the job, come back. When you're 40, you have very few options. And in fact, we've seen in Zambia, the statistics show us that people become, become entrepreneurs when they're retrenched or when they're 60. Hmm. You're not going to succeed. It is hard work. It is definitely a lot harder than being in the corporate world, quite frankly. And it's, but we need to encourage them and we need to say that, you know, if you that bright idea you had, try it. Try to make an app for MTN or Airtel. We need to encourage our children that those, that's also a job and you can succeed in that. And so I spend quite a, little, a lot of time with the youth um, and that's like 25 and below, because I do like their, their minds and they, they want to do so much more. But we also need to encourage that side and say that, you know, you don't have to be a banker, a lawyer, a dentist, a doctor. You can actually be a mobile app creator. You can be an artist, you know, but do what you love and mm. excel at it. Mm. You know, Monica, so often people say that in order to help develop the youth as well as um, share your entrepreneurial skills with others, you need some kind of funding, you need this kind of regulatory approval. But coming back to individuals, Deputy Governor, mm -hmm. what can you and I as individuals do to the fellow sister that sits next to me at work uh, to uplift them? Perhaps it's in the small things as well that the soft skills that women have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, to, to, take up, um, to take up from Monica as well, um, people feel you need to be a politician, to be a leader. But you are a leader right where you are. And we need to be broader in our perspective. And indeed, you can actually mentor people that you work with. If you see that they may be not going in the right direction, maybe they're not putting themselves forward where they could be, um, 
be a friend. Hold the hand of the person next to you and you know, take them up with you and um, uplift them. There's so much that we can do and it's important for us to look at ourselves and pose ourselves that question. What can I do to make a difference? And that's the way that we should be living our lives, always questioning ourselves. What can I do to make a difference in this situation? And we find ourselves in various situations and we need to do different things in different situations. But if we are consciously trying to do good, to make a difference, to have an impact, we need to consciously, deliberately be questioning ourselves all the time. And I don't think a life is worth living if you have not made a difference. So we should all aspire to that. What can I do? Well, that is the question from the day coming from our panelists here, the Deputy Governor. But now we open up the floor to take questions uh, from uh, any of the guests that are joined with us. If you do have a question, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that we get a microphone to you. Hi, I'm Claire Queto simmons from Deloitte. Um, we've heard about the strength of the Old Boys Network and we've heard the advice that we should concentrate on quality and professionalism. But do we not also want to encourage women to really start to market themselves and aggressively network and raise their public profile as they move towards leadership positions? Thank you so much, Claire. Well, we'll come back to the panel and perhaps pick up on the first question or the comment, if I'm not mistaken, regarding, again, perhaps changing the mindset of men when it comes to uh, women wanting to take on entrepreneurial uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, maybe, Monica, you best positioned to respond to this. Uh, women needing the support in order to take on such risks? For sure. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very critical. Um, you will not succeed without uh, your partner or your spouse being um, encouraging and supportive of you. I think the issue is when do you, how do you nurture that understanding and at what stage? Because I think if you're going to nurture it after you've worked for 40 years and at 60 and you say, you know, actually I want to go and open up a, a bakery, he'll probably be less understanding of you. And I mean, I have a different approach or a different line of thinking. You have to start young. You have to go as you mean to proceed. So at, when you're 20 and you know where you want to get, so any man you're going to court or, uh, or you're going to marry, you used to know this is the path you're going to take. This is me and who I am. Mm -hmm. And this is what I would like to do. These are my passions and my dreams. Are you going to be with me on this road? I mean, it's easier said than done. There's so many cultural and um, family other um, issues or which uh, is around, uh, that's around that. But I think you have to make your, your spouse or your partner has to be your partner in your life and your, on, on your path. I don't know if that's helpful because it's, it doesn't address people who are much older. I, I, I speak too much the, the youth about planning for, looking forward. And then for myself, I think I've always thought that, you know, I'm very clear and very honest about where I want to go. I, I am who I am. And so if you're in my life, this is the way it's going to be. And of course, we make, we make sacrifices and concessions because we, we want to achieve a happy family life because that also reflects in your professional life. Mm -hmm. But it's not at the expense of your, your you, you shouldn't, succeed at the expense of your personal life as well, or vice versa. But I think communication is key and understanding where both of you want to be for your family and, you know, and your career progression. The next question, please. Hello. My name is Tafan Squabete. I am with um, Alchemy Women in Leadership as the programs officer. My question is um, regards us as young people in the workplace. Our panel has um, an elderly group of young women. There's a certain point where it was said that we need to stop becoming men, but to realize that we have a contribution to make as young women, as, as women, which means we don't need to become men, but uh, to value our contributions as we are. My question then becomes that as young women, there is that expectation for us to always become sort of like the elderly women. Is there any contribution that we can make as young people as we are? or? Possibly the only way we're going to make it is if we're going to step up and do it the way that our elders are doing it. Mm. Thank you so much. We'll take one more question. My name is Elsie Atifa. I work with the United Nations Development Program. I think we've heard a lot, of, uh, we've heard a lot from the panelists on what is happening. We've also heard that it's slow-paced and that we need to do a lot more. And I think that there are tools and systems and mechanisms that can be used, but we need to formalize it a bit more and institutionalize it a bit more. And I would like to hear from the panelists, living here today, two or three things that we can start working together as a team. You know, we're talking about leading women here. Are there two or three things that we can start working on together? 
how do we formalize it? Yes, we can change the uh, kitchen party discussions, but how do we do it? You know, so I think we should focus a bit more on the house, living here, uh, the, the informal sector, networking, how do you network? I mean, you can be doing that at an individual level, but how do you do that as a group? And I think that is something that I would like to hear a bit more from the panelists. Mm -hmm. How do we leave here with two or three things that we can start working together as a team of leading women? Let's move on to Tafadzwa's question and comment uh, regarding young women uh, that so often we have an expectation to act and project characteristics of our older women. So it seems as though it's, it's a battle of virtues and personality clashes. You know, being that humble, innate, uh, respectable young woman, but at the same time you need to have tough skin to compete with men in the corporate as well as society in general. Brenda, do you have any sentiments regarding this? Yeah, I agree with her that um, y you, you have that uh, fight. Huh? You want to be yourself, and then your mom tells you, but this is not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so you're fighting. It's a fight of trying to discover who you are as an individual. I, I think that um, to make it, first you've got to discover who you are. And you discover who you are by reading. The more you read about other people, autobiographies, the more you realize that you're not the only one that is going through the struggle of self-discovery. And then also you, you learn to write. Write down what, what you're going through. Um, the, 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 the different chemistries that are taking place within yourself, write that down. You, you, you can hide that. Uh, we have our singer, Anna Mali. She sang about a little book, a diary that she used to hide under her pillow. And her naughty brothers and sisters came and found it, and they read all this, ooh, this is what she's going, you know, what's going on in her mind. But you've got to have that book that you write. You know, you write what you're going through. You write the dreams. And, and then next you've got to say, uh, Monica talked about the risk. You've got to say, I'm taking the risk. Not the risk to, to be yourself at the expense of society, but the risk to be yourself because you will not be happy if you're not yourself. So if you can manage to be yourself while being in line with society, well and good. But if you cannot, then you've got to be brave enough to go outside the box and be what you're supposed to be in order for you to be happy. Now, that, that is a process. Each, each one of us must have somebody that we look up to. Even where I am, I look up to some people. Um, I, I look up to those that are able to call me and tell me, look, Brenda, this is not the way to be. This is not the way to dress. This is the way to be. This is the way to dress. You've got to be appropriate. You've got to be this. You, you don't have to detest the older people. Uh, you don't have to, to be suspicious of everything that they tell you. But you've got to find that person that you can talk to. Be yourself. Lay yourself bare before that person. And as time goes on, because you are yourself, you're going to have more people coming to you and give time for them as well. Never be too young. You know, never think yourself too young, rather. You cannot say, I'm too young to mentor somebody. As long as you're a day older than that person, you can mentor them. And so look up to the older people, but don't let them stifle your dreams. Look at the younger people as people that can make you better, um, as people that can train you. We haven't got it all, and, and so you've got to have the dream and go for it. Mm. Monica, just to come back to the closing comments from uh, Alcee, who wants some action to be taken, which is exactly what we need here. Two or three pointers from you with regard to what we can do as a team effort in working together to uh, enhance the development of females. There are a number of organizations, actually some of them are here. I mean, I'm glad to see the Law Association of Zambia is here. And actually what we need to be doing is asking existing organizations what they're doing about uh, encouraging or empowering women within their sphere of their industry or sector and there are a number of efforts being done but hopefully they're not duplicating or cancelling each other's out it's, we see a lot of you know smaller groups trying to get people together and to address issues but I think what we need to be clear is what is the agenda where do we want to what do we want to achieve for instance in the legal sector do we want to see many more female judges many more female prosecutors what are we looking to achieve and addressing it within uh, sort of industry specific um, uh, organizations or grouping. So I think there's, there, is, there are some efforts being done and I think we just have to leverage those and understand what we're trying to achieve. Mm. Um, I wanted to also comment on what Brenda was speaking about, if I can remember the point. <laughs> <laughs> Young women having to uh, often expect it, expect it rather to uh, enact or rather have some of the characteristics to older women. Absolutely. Experience is a great teacher never discounted. So you will say that, oh, you know, my mother doesn't know very much. You'll be surprised. They actually have been through quite a lot. 
and they have learned quite a lot, and although times are very different, there are one or two things you'll see that, oh, actually that did make sense. And as you grow older, you actually see it. And I know, because I, mean, I, mean, I was a young lawyer when I was 22, and I remember thinking some of the, the partner I reported to was so very archaic and very slow. He used to dictate things, and he said, that's not the way anymore. You use an iPad and things like that. But he was meticulous. One thing I appreciated was that he was very detail-oriented, and it's something now I appreciate. So never discount. I mean, there's, there's a lot you can learn from the older generation. Yes, times are different, but there's, no, there's nothing like experience. So grow through it and learn at every stage. Learn from people. But obviously, do sieve, because there are some people who may not, for instance, think you should be doing into making your flip-flops and say you should be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But understand who you are, but do learn from others, I would say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So quite clear, it's uh, know who you are, understand your mindset, know where you're going, as well as uh, being true to who you are and networking quite powerfully. But before we wrap things up, I thought we should just get uh, closing comments from uh, the Deputy Governor as well as Brenda, coming back to Elsie's questions as to practical yeah. examples that we y need to take Yes, I, I actually wanted to say something about uh, Elsie. From where I sit, I, I'm, I'm working with um, a number of other people and organizations to try and engender the financial sector, to try and get greater financial inclusion of women, to try and get more women in decision-making positions in the financial sector. And just looking at that sector, we thought we had gotten beyond uh, this position, but in fact we have not. Sensitization. Um, there's a question, what is this fuss about? What is all the fuss about? And I think we do need to go back to basics. And um, as uh, working together, and as Monica has said, maybe we can leverage on existing organizations. I think we need to go back to again begin to sensitize the society. Why are we even spending so much time talking about gender equality? Why is it important? And I, I think we really do need to get back to those basics and deal with that situation. And that it, it will then be much, much easier to um, deal with the issue of attaining equality of men and women. Mm -hmm. Brenda, your closing comments as to what we can take away and put into action? What I would say to, to every lady, every gentleman, is you are someone. And, um, we, we believe that people will make us, but no, we are all pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. So there's nobody that can tell you this is your place. They have their place. They are trying to find their place in the jigsaw puzzle, and so are you. And um, you're like a book. I, I think that a woman is like a book, and nobody will read you until they turn the page. And so you shouldn't think that your life is over. Your life is like a book being read. You're like a, a water course that is headed for the great deep. You're headed, to the, you're headed not to the river, but you're headed to the sea, to the ocean. And as you go along, you've got all this experience, good and bad, but it's taking you where you ought to be. And don't let the rocks stop you. Don't let anything hinder you, because you are someone. We see why you had that motivational slot on Radio Phoenix. <laughs> It's working. Thank you so, so much to our panelists. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, getting some insights. Hopefully the chairman is impressed with our efforts for today. But uh, again, once more, thanks to uh, the, ba the Bank of Zambia's Deputy Governor, Dr. Tungia, Tukia Kankasa Mabula, as well as Brenda Muntemba, Chief Programs Officer for Zambia National, no National Commission for UNESCO, and the Chief Executive of Java Foods, Monica Musondo. Well, that does bring an end to this CNBC Africa special regarding leadership and woman leadership in Zambia. Do join us again next time.